Okay, I'd like to introduce Nia Moore, so next speaker. So Nia Moore is a Chancellor's Fellow in Sociology at the University of Edinburgh, where her work is centrally concerned with re-envisioning an eco-feminist politics of sustainability. So her background is in interdisciplinary feminist studies and she works across many fields, so the social sciences and the humanities, as well as involving peace camps, allotments, and an LGBT youth group. So she has a forthcoming book, The Changing Nature of Eco-Feminist Politics, telling stories from Cliocot Sound, is that okay? Vancouver, um, UBC Press, and it will be out in April of 2015. So there you go. Mm, thanks. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. So first of all, just thanks to Yannicka for the invite. It's great to um, be here. This is kind of right up my street. And um, I guess having an interdisciplinary background, I love this experience. I've been in a room, we're all kind of talking about the same thing while we're all also talking about very different things at the same time. So to dive straight um, in, um, what I want to do today, and I forgot, I'm, oh yeah, I'm in charge of my slides, aren't I? <laughs> um, um, what I want to do in terms of thinking about radical methodologies for the post-humanities is to turn to what might seem um, like a humanist method and think how might we rethink this um, for the post-humanities. <clears throat> so I'm specifically talking um, about oral history, but to some extent because my work straddles um, social sciences and humanities, so I'm thinking oral history, life stories, and, and interview, really, um, in a way, as well. And so, um, yeah, and so we've already had, I suppose, in Leslie's talk, this kind of question of um, these kinds of, yeah, discourse-based methods, and then that are kind of turned into kind of transcripts and texts. And, um, and um, I suppose we're in a context where is, there is this debate about, um, you know, do we need to use new sensory methods or new kinds of methods in order to access something that we might now be calling the post-humanities? So it's in this context, I suppose, that I'm trying to raise this question of, can we retrieve anything <clears throat> from these kind of currently slightly objected methods, I think? Um, <clears throat> and... Um, and I suppose I'm particularly focused on oral history, partly because of the project that I'm talking about, but also um, because uh, oral history, particularly in its history in the UK, um, has this kind of focus on, uh, obviously, individual agents acting in the world and making history. So oral history in the UK has a particular kind of radical history as a radical methodology, as um, a method used both by um, academics and activists and community historians as a way of putting those who are kind of marginalized um, from history and uh, using those kinds of stories to, might, to transform what we might think about as history. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, women's history, LGBT history, you know, labor history, um, in the UK is a kind of significant site uh, for the development of oral history. Um, so in that sense then, it really seems, I suppose, it's very much uh, bound up with notions of humanist agency and humans acting in and on the world. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, the question is, <laughs> is um, you know, can we do something with it in the context of a kind of post-human world? And so um, I'm going to um, draw on some research that I've carried out and which um, is this book that Yannick has just mentioned is coming out shortly, um, which is based on oral ethnographic research and oral history interviews with women environmental activi activists um, in this place called Clackwood Sand, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, in British Columbia in Canada. So it was really nice to see those uh, slides from Oliver uh, Kellerman earlier. That's uh, Cortez Island, which is the other side of Vancouver Island. But anyway, in the kind of same ballpark is where I'm talking about. So, you know, uh, some other kind of links between the papers in terms of locations. Um, and I suppose part of the points to raise about this project is that although the book is coming out uh, next month, um, the research on which this um, project was based was carried out uh, largely in the mid-1990s, um, early 90s to mid-90s. So partly I want to say that it, this was, uh, the research was carried out at a time before the turn to the hum post-humanities, I think, had really taken off in the way that it has. Um, so I think it's interesting that if I was going and doing that research now, the kinds of methodological questions that I might be thinking about going to do that research, I think would be very um, different. So yeah, so it was both a, a kind of time and a topic before, before this methodological um, 
turn, I suppose, and kind of conceptual turn. Um, and I want to turn to um, this quote from Sarah Watmore, which I find kind of fruitful in, um, in my process of kind of rethinking what the oral histories that I was doing were about. Um, um, and this is, Sarah Watmore is a cultural geographer or rural, started out as a rural geographer in the UK. Um, and she's, so she's talking about what's happening in cultural geography, but obviously it's not confined to cultural geography. And she, I liked the fact that she made this argument that what's happening around the more than human or the post-human or whatever kinds of terms we might use, that it's not about a rupture, um, but she's suggesting that it's a kind of product of repetition, the product of kind of repeating and returning to things. So as somebody with a bit of a historical imagination, I liked this attention um, to historicity. And I liked as well how she wrote about her early work as a rural geographer. Um, and her, in her paper, her kind of gentle and careful reminder that, where she pointed out that her concern um, in, with the obdurately earthy interests in cultivation and property, growing and eating, were not always seen in a fashionable light. So she's making this point that research that she carried out as a rural geographer in the kind of 70s, it was not very fashionable then to be interested in farming and soil and earthworms and growing things in the way that maybe these things are very popular now. But at the same time, I was um, then surprised when at the, in the close of this paper, given this kind of attention to history, historicity, she talked about the urgent need to supplement humanist methods that rely on generating talk and text with experimental practices that might amplify other sensory, bodily, and affective registers um, in order to extend the company and modality of what might constitute a research subject. So this is kind of one of the departure points for me uh, in terms of this rethinking of oral history. Um, so I'm, and I'm obviously not intending to um, object to the notion of experimental practices, but what I want to take issue with really is the splitting of humanist methods, which are seen to generate talk and text, um, with experimental practices um, which are seen to amplify other registers. Um, and I suppose I'm also taking issue in a way with the, the temporality of her claim about urgency. Um, um, partly kind of because I want to say and, you know, hopefully convince you through the end that humanist methods might also always be experimental. So just the brief, anybody who's ever done an interview will know that they're never the same. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you can prepare all you like, <laughs> but you never quite know what's going to happen when you knock on that door or turn on that tape recorder, what somebody is going to tell you or disclose in the context of kind of research projects. Um, and so my suggestion is not so much that we necessarily need experimental practices which amplify other registers in the process of research, but, also, but, but rather that the amplification is probably required <clears throat> at least as much in the interpretation and communication of research. And this is part of what I try and do in my discussion of, um, discussion of the research in um, Tlaquit Sound. Um, so that we can, so that the process of research and writing up and redescription and interpretation might take account of other registers that coexist and co-emerge with talk. Um, and so conversely, um, to suggest as well that the kinds of experimental practices that Watmore might have in mind will almost inevitably also involve talk and text. Um, but there's also, but there's the tendency, I think, in the kind of the turn. Um, to new methods to downplay uh, the role of talk and text in experimental methods rather than realizing that, you know, um, very generally they're part, of, um, they're part of this. And I suppose that's a kind of version of multimodality that Leslie was talking about in a way. Um, but sometimes it seems to me that there's a kind of resounding silence about the talk and text <laughs> that's happening in the context of other projects. Um, so, you know, I want to come back at the end to the possibility of using supposedly humanist methods um, to kind of expand this notion of what might constitute um, a research subject. And, and I mean, the other point here is just that I think it's interesting that without even mentioning interviews, uh, you know, Susan, uh, Sarah Watmore manages, I think, to convey that that's really what she's talking about here is largely the kind of social science interview. Um, so what I want to do is I'm gonna do a really kind of quick brief overview of some work on, on post-humanism just to situate where I'm coming from and on the one hand I'm hoping that some of this is familiar to people and then on the other hand because of course we have kind of diverse disciplines in the, in the audience maybe it isn't um, uh, familiar to everybody. 
or also just to show kind of where I'm coming coming in at this, and then I'll kind of move on to the to kind of discuss the empirical work. Um, so, um, so I always like to turn to Haraway. <laughs> uh, it's always a kind of key uh, text for me. And so this is kind of one version of post-humanism. So I just want to unpack several versions unpack briefly several versions of post-humanism. So Haraway's talking about this version of post-humanism that is a kind of transhumanist techno-enhancement. Um, so this notion that of kind of prosthesis or, you know, just that the technology allows some kind of extension. Um, and uh, as you can tell from this, Haraway is not at all <laughs> I'm keen on this kind of version of um, post-humanism, um, that she thinks that this it can be too easily appropriated by the blissed out, let's all be post-humanist and find our next teleological evolutionary stage in some kind of transhumanist techno-enhancement. Um, she's not impressed. So she, um, so she turns to companion species. One of her arguments for turning to companion species is to get away from post-humanism, and she now you know, tries to avoid using the term as much as she can. Now, obviously, this is just one version of um, post-humanism. So, um, <clears throat> so this is Bray Dotty um, talking about two slightly different versions of post-humanism. Um, so she talks about a philosophical post-human of the post-structuralist generation, and she talks about a second version of post-humanism, which is a more targeted form of post-anthropocentrism that is not as widespread. Um, so, yeah, so a very different account of post-humanism to Haraway's, even though obviously their work is kind of very engaged with each other. Um, and, um, and I suppose I find Braidotti's account quite interesting because I think that this uh, first form of post-humanism that she identifies as, as kind of post-structuralism is not what a lot of people would maybe take uh, as kind of post-humanism. And I think here what she's referring to, which is useful given my interest in kind of interviews and oral history and narrative, is this notion of, um, of post-structuralism um, being kind of part of a move towards unpacking the notion of a kind of essentialist identity in kind of interview transcripts or whatever. So, so she's kind of suggesting here that we might think about um, that process of looking at interviews and accounts for a non-essentialized kind of identity or account of the self as a kind of site of post-humanism. Um, but obviously the second... Um, post-humanism that she's identifying here, which is, this, which is more explicitly a form of post-anthropocentrism, so a uh, kind of move um, away from human centrism, <clears throat> I guess, that um, you know, might be identified with uh, humanism. Um, so this is useful to me, and I think um, her first account here chimes to me a little bit with um, Catherine Hales, who we've also already heard mention of, so this notion that post-humanism is not about the addition of some prosthesis, but it's the ability to be subjective in the view of the self. So, um, so I find this quite useful for thinking about interviews. But I'm still interested in this, in Braidotti's kind of post-anthropocentric um, post-humanism and how we might think about moving um, kind of beyond human centrism or decentering the human. Um, and so I'm also just briefly going to mention the work by... Richard Twine, where he's picking this up, and his, uh, he's done a lot of work on ecofeminism, so which is partly why I'm kind of naming, although in this paper um, he doesn't explicitly name his approach as ecofeminist, he's citing Val Plumwood and various other ecofeminists and talking about feminism and environmentalism. Um, and Twine, as well, is kind of trying to distinguish between posthumanisms. Well, but, but trying to kind of define a kind of critical posthumanism, which is again not this kind of techno enhancement, um, but a critical posthumanism that's inflected by feminism and environmentalism, and which he's suggesting that um, is not necessarily radically opposed to all variations of humanism. And I think here he's picking up on some of Al Plumwood's work that there might be human benefits to decentering the human in a way. Um, so that's a kind of familiar feminist. Argument And here as well, I just want to return briefly to Haraway and her um, account of why she never wanted to be post-human. I never wanted to be post-human or post-humanist any more than I wanted to be post-feminist. 
So making this argument that obviously women have often been excluded from the category of human, and so a kind of argument here that women have never been human, um, and that's why she will never be a post-humanist or a post-feminist. Um, so, and this brings me to um, this point by Dmitri Papadopoulos, um, that one kind of tendency sometimes in some work on post-humanism is that... Um, how is it possible to homogenize non-humans? Um, I've just made a mistake there, so that should be how, it is, how is it possible to homogenize humans? <laughs> um, <laughs> clearly, when I was typing this out, I had slightly more non-humans on the brain. So he's, he's saying that, um, <laughs> that something that happens in the turn to post-humanism is that the human um, becomes homogenized again. Um, and I think this... Uh, this point about the sometimes the kind of the social drops out of this account of the human, and the human is kind of re reified, which I guess is what I'm saying we can see in Haraway's kind of critique and her um, reluctance to engage with post humanism. So, holding that in mind, because um, I will come back to these in my analysis, I want to turn to um, Clackwood Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, where in the early um, 1990s, um, there was a campaign against deforestation, against clear-cut logging of temperate rainforest on the west coast of Canada. Um, and a peace camp was set up uh, here in this kind of middle photo um, to protest the logging. Um, the peace camp was, and so, so people camped over three or four months. For those of you familiar, say, with something like Greenham Common in the UK, this was 10 years after the Greenham Common uh, peace camp um, was set up. So people came to the, to the, to the camp, um, camped out overnight, and then got up really early the following morning, kind of 3 or 4 a.m., to go onto logging roads um, and block the logging roads before the loggers came in at daylight. So that's what we're seeing here. And then um, the, the police, the, the RCMP, came along and arrested uh, people and who stood on the road and brought them to, um, to jail where people were processed. So over the course of the summer... Uh, there were blockades every, mor every morning, Monday to Friday, and um, over 800 people were arrested, and many people saved, served jail sentences as part of this kind of non-violent um, protest. Um, and I went um, in 1996 and interviewed a lot of the women involved in this campaign. So the campaign was said to be based on feminist and eco-feminist principles. It was a mixed camp, so there were men and women at the camp, but there was the sense of it being informed um, by feminism. And I was very interested at this point in the early to mid-90s about uh, feminist debates about essentialism and the ways in which ecofeminism was being dismissed for being essentialist, um, and particularly strongly by other feminists. Um, and I was interested in my sense that there was, there, there was something more going on in ecofeminism than some kind of repetition of essentialism or repetition of maternalism. So, um, so the basis of my research was going and um, interviewing women who'd been involved um, about their involvement in the camp and also um, doing kind of life history interviews, so kind of oral history of camp life and also of their life histories. Um, so one of the points that I want to make here that, that at the time puzzled me um, hugely when I was asking people to be involved in the research but um, makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> um, in retrospect, was when I was asking people and saying that I wanted to hear about their experiences of the camp and the campaign, and that I wanted to situate this in the context of their lives, so that I was also interested in a kind of biographical interview, uh, life history interview. So m most people were very happy to be involved and to be interviewed, but there were a number of people who made a distinction between being interviewed about the camp and the campaign and having a kind of life history interview of themselves. And I was initially puzzled about why people were kind of saying they didn't want to do the life history bit, but they were happy to talk about the camp, and I probably initially just thought they were shy. <laughs> but um, in retrospect, I mean, I make sense of this in terms of people wanting to avoid heroic narratives. So a kind of commitment to um, the campaign and to the politics as a collective process and uh, um, a resistance to any individuals being picked out, which was you know, not quite my intention, but I wasn't thinking about it like that. So we're very happy to talk endlessly about the camp and the campaign, but not 
to center themselves in any way. Um, so this was, yeah, quite interesting for me to, to, um, to, to figure out in terms of thinking about humanist <laughs> projects. Um, and so what I want to do is to focus on um, an interview with one woman and take some quotes um, from one woman to think about what might have been going on um, in her interview and how we might think about a move from uh, a kind of humanist notion of agency to maybe some kind of more than human self. Um, so this is uh, a woman called J <coughs> sorry <coughs> Jane Fawkes, who um, was about 60 when I interviewed her. Uh, and um, she's an artist, um, and she's married, <clears throat> and had some grown sons. And um, this was one account of, you know, one extract from her interview, um, saying, so anyway, we just got to the camp that evening. That I was really, she was really concerned about her granddaughter, and she just thought, you know, I have to go and get, um, this is why I'm, you know, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for my granddaughter. Um, and so... So I want to suggest that there's kind of something about humanist agency in here, this notion that she can do this thing, that she can take this action, that it might have some, um, it might have some impact on the world. Um, and in a way, it's a kind of paradigmatic story of ecofeminist activism as well, this notion of kind of also concern about a child. Um, but I also want to suggest there's some other things going on in uh, other parts of Jane's account. So... I want to suggest that we can see something of, you know, what I called earlier this kind of post-structuralist subjectivity going on. So late, this is late in the interview with Jane, and I realised I hadn't asked her any questions explicitly about feminism, so I asked, you know, would you describe yourself as a feminist? And she um, immediately responds by talking about motherhood um, and how she liked being a mother, and that at this point... Um, when I suppose she was a mother of young children, was in the mid-60s, and so she's recognising that this was a time of a kind of emergence of feminism and that, you know, she's making this point that actually at the time uh, she thought that her friends who became involved in feminism, um, you know, that it wasn't a really good move for them because she was really happy <laughs> and they became um, kind of very, very miserable. Um, but... Um, but it seems to me that there's some of this kind of reflection on subjectivity going on, and this kind of continues when she goes on to say that eventually, you know, she has come to identify as a feminist. Um, you know, that she really sort of got it, and now she's trying to teach, you know, she's spending, expending kind of considerable energy within her own family, uh, talking to her husband and sons and trying to help them to kind of get feminism and why, uh, why she's a feminist, and um, the kind of labour involved in all of this. Um, so, so I think there's a little bit of a shift here to a sense of her account of kind of transformation and change. Um, but I think this is still a fairly kind of humanist uh, story. So um, the next quote that I want to put up um, is actually from the very beginning of the interview. So these, these uh, quotes I've been showing haven't obviously been in the order of the interview. So I want to... Um, put up this quote about uh, where she actually started the interview. And this was um, after me um, explaining at great length about why I was interested in people's kind of biographies and lives and histories and that, you know, she could tell it whatever way she wanted and start wherever she wanted. And, um, and Jane actually seemed quite impatient while I was doing my kind of spiel <laughs> at the beginning. Um, so this is where she started. Um, so she started her account in the middle of her life, like not at the kind of chronological beginning. So she started about the year before she went to Tlaqua and was arrested. Um, and, um, um, and so partly what she's saying in here is that at that point, about a year before the Tlaqua camp, she was really um, reflecting on her own early experience of sexual abuse um, and that this was what was going on. Um, and actually, when she's telling me that, she's saying that she was in no place or no position to get arrested at the camp, in fact. So she was just like, oh, I just had too much going on. Um, but actually, her husband was really interested in getting um, arrested uh, at the camp and that they uh, talked long and hard about it and eventually decided that he would um, get arrested and that she would kind of support him in the process. Um, but actually, in the end, she changes her mind and she goes and gets arrested um, as well. Um, 
but I mean, in providing kind of different um, accounts of why Jane um, says that she gets arrested and why she ends at the camp, I'm obviously not trying to suggest that uh, Jane is kind of confused or inconsistent. Um, but rather that there's obviously many stories about why she does what she does and many ways in which she makes um, sense of it. Um, but also, I want to suggest here that this, that what I was then beginning to see once I uh, spent a long time poring over her interview, is that this, for me, was not a humanist narrative of agency, right? It's, for me, it wasn't actually about a teleology from child to adult, adult from passivity or even victimhood to agency or heroism when she got arrested. Um, but it is this move of turning and returning to her life, right, in the course of the interview. She's kind of turning and returning to moments in her life and um, restorying them in various ways and, and, um, and thinking about how um, meanings have kind of changed over time. Um, and, and partly what I'm trying to do is to kind of do some justice in a way by actually putting her account out of uh, order in which she told us to kind of convey some of the ways in which she did to tell the story. Um, and... Um, and so partly as well, I wanted to do, um, partly I wanted to play with some text, and this is um, just um, kind of very simple ideas um, about how we might play it with text or think about uh, what Jane might have been doing in her interview and what kind of account she's um, producing. So partly I'm using a notion from um, Dmitri Papadopoulos that I mentioned earlier of kind of continuous experience. So this notion that experience might be continuous rather than just kind of cumulative and, and kind of linear um, and narrative. But I also want to make a point obviously about uh, academic conventions of presenting kind of quotes in the neat way that I have been up until um, now. <laughs> um, and we don't present the kind of mess around the, the edges. So I just wanted to kind of mess with the quotes a little bit um, and make them a little bit incomprehensible in the way that sometimes listening to somebody's story for the first time is a little bit incomprehensible because there's a lot of stuff coming. Um, but I also wanted to make the point that even though um, the conventions are to present the quotes nice and neatly. I mean, we all know, or once you've been an academic <laughs> um, for a little while or a student for a little while, you know that those quotes are not as neat as they look. So there's the convention of presenting the neat quotes extracted from something. But actually, we all know the massive amount of labor that goes into producing those quotes. And we also know, <clears throat> I think, about the, what I might call the excess of the interview and the excess of what's going on that doesn't always make it into either the conference presentation or the written paper. Um, and although it doesn't always make it into the paper or into the paper directly, maybe makes it into the written up publications indirectly, I also want to say that at the same time it would be disingenuous um, to pretend that we don't know that the practice is messy, you know, that it's, it's not as kind of simple as just critiquing people for not presenting everything or for extracting kind of particular quotes. Um, so I want to talk about while, while I was interviewing Jane, that I interviewed her in the kitchen of her house where she has moved after her experience of getting arrested at Tlaquot. So although she and her husband had moved to kind of retire um, out of Vancouver City to Comox Valley on Vancouver Island, after the um, experience of getting arrested and being involved in the campaign, they moved again to Denman Island, which is not so far from Cortez Island earlier, um, to, be, to live among people that they had met in the campaign. So they upped sticks again, basically. Um, and they bought a piece of land that they're living on with five other families in five different households. Um, and they're engaging in permaculture on the land and they're trying to grow trees and small forest with a view to selective logging in the future. So not the kind of clear cut logging, but trying to think differently about um, different ways in which you might kind of engage with forestry. So there's this whole um, kind of story that I'm being told kind of before, during and after the interview, which you know informs um, you know, my kind of understanding of Jane. And there's, so one more quote from the interview. So at some point when she is talking about being a child, and this is the point when she was being abused, um, she makes this point, and for me, because she had a lonely childhood, because she wasn't able to relate to people. So for me, sort of nature and being alone with nature was really important. Um, 
J Jane was not the only person that I interviewed who produced this a kind of account of a childhood where there was a separation between um, the public world and the kind of social world, the private world of the kind of domestic world, and, um, and a world of nature, <laughs> which was kind of outside the social in a way or something. It, or it was, the, I mean, obviously it's not outside the social, particularly because a lot of girls could no longer access the space after they're 12. So I'm not saying it's outside the social, but it was this other space. So I think it kind of complicates the dualisms that we're often... Uh, that we often think about, um, especially if we think about how children might relate to dualisms um, and how people might kind of find spaces and places where they can manage. But the point here is, so she's talking about this lonely experience and that nature was the only place um, that she could go. And actually what I'm trying to say is that through the interview and through her, um, through her story of the campaign and what happened through the campaign and of how she's transformed her sense of self so that she is no longer uh, a kind of lonely child in nature, but rather is part of um, this collective experience of the peace camp for starters. So she, she talks at length about how she, there's no way she could have gotten arrested on her own because of her kind of fear of authority, but the fact that there were hun literally hundreds of people at the camp every day in a kind of huge production, so that that's really important. But also that her experience of nature is now transformed from this nature that is external. So that kind of childhood story still looks like a, you know, she's in nature, but it's separate from her, it's apart from her. But this experience of living on community, on with the land, <laughs> um, and this experience of kind of permaculture and trying to think of being in a different relationship with trees, anyway, is part of me trying to suggest that maybe we can approach interviews and oral histories and apparently kind of humanist methods and kind of retrieve um, um, a little bit of them so that we can also go back to this quote that I showed to start off with and think differently about this. Um, so this is the one about turning up with a camp and a grandmother. Um, and I'm just going to put Butler in here as well, I suppose, as she's one of those people who's held up as one of those post-structuralist subjectivity people, but this notion of being undone. And I want to suggest that in this previous quote that we could think about this as Jane being undone by her granddaughter, but also being undone by the devastation um, of the kind of the landscape around her, that, so that she is being undone and kind of redone through the process of the campaign and through the process of the kind of changes that she's constantly making in her, in her life. Um, and, um, and so, you know, what more also says this, but I think I'm trying to say that we don't, uh, yeah, again, it's not a point about kind of a critique of experimental practices. It's like, what can we still, you know, <laughs> what can we still get out of the interview or oral history in this time so that, um, that there might be this shift from the indifferent stuff of a world out there um, to the intimate fabric of corporal reality that includes and redistributes the in here of the human being. And I think there's something of this going on in Jane's account, basically. Um, that, you know, it's not this progress narrative, it's not a kind of neoliberal individualist story of victimhood and heroism. Um, and so, just to finish, so we might think about this as not so much humanist methods, but about Haraway's version of kind of becoming worldly when we have never been human. Um, anyway, so that's where I'm going to finish. <laughs> <clears throat>